This is Atlanta, Georgia. It's my hometown. It's also where I became a sports fan. I played some sports as a kid, and I love sports. In fact, my first real job in journalism was covering the 1996 Olympic Games. I've changed a lot since then. You can see it in my hairline alone, but the city has too, especially in downtown Atlanta, which remains the epicenter of sports in Atlanta. The Hawks play within steps of the Falcons, and the College Football Hall of Fame is right across Centennial Park. Georgia Tech plays football at one of the oldest stadiums in the NCAA, just up the street. And all of this is located in the heart of Fulton County. You probably heard that name a few times in the recent elections. Fulton County. From Fulton County. Fulton County. A big part of that difference is in these counties, in this metro Atlanta area. A solidly red state for almost 30 years, back to when Bill Clinton was first elected, Georgia was suddenly in play in 2020 and record voter turnout ultimately played a key role in determining the balance of power in the United States. But if you were living in Atlanta last summer, record-setting voting seemed unlikely at best. Scenes like this playing out across Fulton County Tuesday, starting early in the morning, extending through midnight. The June 9th primary election is a primary example of systematic oppression that the people of this county still face. But far from disaster, Fulton County became a model of turnout and voter efficiency, along the way creating one of the largest voting precincts in the history of the United States. At the heart of the effort, Atlanta's sports franchises and athletes. And while some owners would open their doors, literally and figuratively, to activism, others would oppose it and end up losing their teams altogether. When you own a sports franchise, hopefully any business, but certainly a sports franchise, you have an obligation uh, to try to be relevant to the public and to the community you operate in. And that's actually good business and the right thing to do. You could just literally feel a culture shift happening. I felt like I was just excited to be a part of a city that stands for something. By now, we all know the results of those key elections, but behind the scenes were a series of crucial moves. I wanted to hear from the people who made those decisions and who once again turned Atlanta into a microcosm of race, politics, and sports. Now look, I know Atlanta doesn't boast the championships of New York, Boston, or LA. It's nowhere close, sadly, but Atlanta's long been a sports town, and the history of its athletes and teams, well, it's inextricably tied to its central role in the civil rights movement. Well, in my uh, days in Atlanta as a child, there was a pretty strict system of segregation. The birthplace of Martin Luther King Jr. and the home to luminaries such as Andrew Young and the late Congressman John Lewis. Atlanta, which once built itself the city too busy to hate, has also been home to some of the most exciting, legendary, and controversial sports figures, franchises, and events of the past 50 years. In 2020, with sports largely sidelined by the global pandemic, those downtown Atlanta teams didn't fare so well, even if there was no one there to see it. The Hawks missed the playoffs again, and the Falcons, well, they found new ways to lose. But on those same courts and fields, both athletes and owners made generation-defining decisions. Now, I wish I could take you back to Atlanta, show you all of this myself, but the global pandemic won't allow for that either. So I'm gonna do the best that I can from here in my daughter's bedroom in New York. Okay, so let's look at the players here. Here's downtown Atlanta. This is State Farm Arena. It's where the Hawks play. They're owned by a group led by investor Tony Ressler and his family. The CEO is a native Atlantan and longtime Coca-Cola and Turner broadcasting executive named Steve Coonan. And up until recently, the head coach of the Hawks was Lloyd Pierce. He's part of a new generation of young activist NBA leaders. All three of these men played a huge role in turning the stadium into a voting center. Nearby is the giant, newly constructed Mercedes-Benz Stadium. This is where the Atlanta Falcons, along with Major League Soccer's Atlanta United, both owned by Home Depot co-founder Arthur Blank, play their games. It, too, would become an early voting center in the Senate runoff elections. Of course, where to vote was critical, but so too was getting people motivated. And that's where the city's athletes came in, spurred by local leaders, as well as the activist heritage of Atlanta. Few played a more notable role than WNBA star Renee Montgomery. 
She gave up a year of playing for the Atlanta Dream in order to partner with activist groups like Fair Fight and More Than a Vote. We'll get into all of that, but where this story really starts is late May of 2020 with the killing of George Floyd. If ain't no justice, no peace. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Breonna Taylor gets shot and killed in her own home. Ahmaud Arbery gets shot and killed uh, while he's simply going on a jog down in Georgia. George Floyd is choked out and lynched on camera in front of all of us to witness live and in person. And you have, uh, you know, millions of black people, young black people in particular, all around this country who are upset, they're angry, they're frustrated. This is Michael Tyler. He also grew up in Atlanta, and now he's the executive vice president of More Than a Vote. That's a group started by LeBron James in 2020 to mobilize voters by tapping athletes and entertainers to spread the word city by city and state by state. I I want a, a, a righteous anger. The key is to be able to channel that anger. I think a lot of the athletes themselves felt the exact same way. I think what it did was crystallize for all of us the need to form an organization like this, realizing that the best way to fight back in this moment and to create a more just society for our communities is through the electoral process. When I think back to the summer of 2020, I just think back to to all the passion in the city. You know, I was out there giving waters and and having cookouts for the protesters. Uh, There was a lot of energy. And I'm like, man, we got to make sure that all these people vote. Renee Montgomery is a two-time WNBA champion. And as of last summer, she was the point guard for the Atlanta Dream. But in June, she announced she would opt out of the 2020 season, deciding to dedicate her time to social justice. And a big part of her message was relatively simple vote. Big news this week when Atlanta Dream Guard Renee Montgomery announced she was going to skip the upcoming 2020 WNBA season. I started to realize when people are asking me, are you excited about this upcoming season? And I was like, I hadn't even been thinking about it. That started to trigger my mind that maybe I need to follow, you know, what my where my mind is and what where my heart is. I mean, it's not it, it is not a light decision at all. I mean, and listen, I'm not a professional athlete. You are. But but I can only imagine that like You've got your routine. You know what you've got to do. You literally know the steps you have to take to to get there, to to get the brass ring. This path is not so clear in terms of like, how do you get people out to vote? What do they do? How did you go about saying, all right, this is how I spend my time. These are the projects that I want to do. For me, I want to help, but I want to make sure that I'm like helping in the right way. So I don't want to just be out there doing anything. I wanted to make sure that, you know, the messaging was what it should be and that it was correct. It was factual. And I had to lean on people that know what they're doing. So that's uh, more than a vote. I remember Renee reaches out. uh, She reached out to me personally via email and said, hey, Michael, I don't know if you've heard. I had heard, (laughs) but I chose to step away from uh, basketball full time uh, to focus exactly on these sorts of efforts. So, you know, whatever it is that you need me to do, I'm all in. Wow. Since that day, she has become one of our top advocates for all of our work, particularly down in Georgia and Atlanta, which was ground zero for many of our efforts in the general election. But with the pandemic in full force all around her, Boots on the Ground was largely virtual, and Montgomery set about mobilizing and motivating from her home. I know there's difference on opinions on how to handle it and what to do, whatever you do, just be safe, protect you, protect your neighbor. We don't wanna hurt anybody, so. Keep the energy going, make it peaceful, but keep it going, let's not stop. A room in her house would get fully converted, equipped with cameras, lighting, even space for photo shoots and music recording. I have major studio envy. Like if you could see like where I am, I'm like, I'm actually in my daughter's bedroom and I have like Anna and Elsa over here. Like it's just. Oh, you're trying to build a snowman over there. Okay. You clearly have it down. Listen, this is the welcome to the new normal, right? Like this is the office, right? My home has become the studio. That means like for video, this is where I film TMZ sports at every day right here in our studio. So it's kind of crazy to think about. My podcast is called Remotely Renee because I had to figure out how to do everything remotely. Montgomery would also create initiatives around increasing involvement in local politics, 
She raised money to improve education at HBCUs and spoke to a lot of people about voting. What do you tell young people and how are you encouraging them to get out there, register and vote? One of the things they're gonna tackle is voter suppression. As you spoke about earlier, I'm here in Georgia, so that's my connection, my strong tie with them. And I'm excited to get things going with, with more than a vote campaign. I've heard people tell me I'm not into politics, but I want to remind them, you may not be into politics, but politics is into you. Hello, thank you. It decides whether you make a minimum wage. It decides whether you get a stimulus check. It decides whether you get charged with a misdemeanor or a felony. For Renee and for these athletes writ large, it speaks to their understanding of the power of their own voice. Right. And they know see, that, you know, no matter future, how individually they choose to leverage it, they know that there's power. You know, it's synonymous with the way that LeBron thinks about things, too. When she stepped away, she knew what she cared about. She knew what she wanted to do, but she wanted to make sure that she had a specific plan of action for how she was actually going to execute her activism. Athletes speaking out on issues off the field or court hasn't always been well received. Look no further than the way fans, national politicians, and the media treated Colin Kaepernick. After he spoke out against racial injustice, he couldn't get a job, despite being considered one of the top players at his position. LeBron, of course, was famously told to, quote, shut up and dribble back in 2018. But his refusal to back down, along with a growing chorus of black athletes, especially in the WNBA and the NBA, ensured that activism would be an integral part of their professional lives. Athletes are able to communicate with other young black people in a way that no politician can ever do. They're able to lay out mistakes and lay out their personal motivations in a way that is going to resonate with other young black voters that is simply unique. And so when you have an entire coalition of athletes doing that, it becomes, you know, a force multiplier within our community and, you know, just speaks uh, to, the, to the importance of, of voting in a way that simply nobody else can. But while Montgomery was working to get out the vote, those newly inspired folks had to have somewhere to show up and vote and safely, given the global pandemic. Today, voters in Georgia were met with long lines and confusion at polling places as they tried to cast ballots in the state's primary elections. From the air, you could see long lines of Georgia voters, socially distanced, stretching through parking lots. They hold the line, the machines don't work, and that we're just stuck here. Thousands waited hours to cast ballots, and frustration was evident. Please, God, help us! Fulton County being the largest county in the state of Georgia, Therefore, we're the focal point for anything that goes right or wrong. This is Rob Pitts. He's the chairman of Fulton County's Board of Commissioners. A lot did go wrong in those early June primaries. And in a state with a long history of voter suppression, long wait lines disproportionately affected black citizens. For Chairman Pitts, the pandemic was creating both a health and a political crisis. Many of the precincts that we had historically used and traditionally used because of the coronavirus, the uh, they said, well, you can no longer use our facility because we're afraid many of the workers who are going to work on election day, in fact, six out of seven at the last minute decided that they were not going to work because they were afraid. A primary vote is one thing, but on deck was a critical series of elections, a runoff, a generationally important presidential election, and not one, but two U.S. Senate races. And tensions only increased as a city long accustomed to complicated racial politics took part in a national reckoning around inequality and injustice. Tonight, anger and frustration in Atlanta. Crowds gathering outside the fire gutted Wendy's where 27 year old Rayshard Brooks was shot and killed by police during an attempted arrest. Within 24 hours, Atlanta's police chief stepped down. The officer who shot Brooks was fired and the other officer involved placed on administrative duty. The protests, they really happened at the nexus of where our arena is. Marietta Street and Centennial Olympic Park, right on the park next to CNN is our building. This is Steve Coonan. He's the CEO of the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. And in watching these protests, I was just struck with the passion. I was struck with the peaceful way that these young people were out protesting. And to me, the only action, the only change that ever comes is with voting. The most powerful thing you can do is vote. And at the time, we were sitting on an empty arena. No basketball, no concerts, no shows. But we had something in our arena that is rare. You can find it in very few places, and that space, 700,000 square feet. 
we actually were sitting around. Uh, again, there were others involved. And uh, I guess as the owner, uh, you get to take credit for things that you really didn't do or, or think of. So uh, I'd be uh, on that category. But we were trying to figure out how can we help the community? This is the owner of the Hawks, Tony Ressler. He made his fortune through Aries Capital, an investing firm he created in the 1990s. He put together a group to buy the Hawks back in 2015, and while his main residence is in Los Angeles, he and his wife, the actress Jamie Gertz, have become hands-on team owners. Why not use the arena as a voting location, as a bowling location? We weren't sure we could do it, and frankly, we weren't sure Fulton County would permit us to do it. I absolutely remember getting a call and phone rang. I actually have a flip phone. I have it. So it rang. And uh, on the other end was my uh, good friend, Steve Coonan. So he said, well, look, we, we, we're we dark. Uh, there are no games planned here. We'd like to be being a good corporate citizen. We would like to find out and to know if there is a role that uh, we at the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena can play. And I said, Steve. Let me get back to you. So in less than five minutes, I got back to him and I said, okay, we got a deal. Today, officials from Fulton County and the Atlanta Hawks announced the opening of Georgia's largest early voting precinct at State Farm Arena. The plan is to use it starting July 20th in the primary runoff, as well as for the fall general election. I think we caught everybody off guard. And I think as soon as you hear the idea, you kind of go, well, that makes sense. I mean, it's so simple. This is not rocket science of an idea. It's simple. So the plan was the then empty State Farm Arena would be turned into what was known as a super polling location, meaning anyone in Fulton County would be able to come to the arena to vote. The court of the arena would be dedicated to socially distanced voting machines, 100 machines for the July runoff election, and then tripling to 300 for the general election in November. Conference rooms would be converted for poll workers to process votes, including mail-in voting. The Hawks Foundation would also provide 1,500 free parking spots in the surrounding area to accommodate voters. And in addition to the site, the Hawks added a critical piece, some 350 full-time staffers, 200 of whom would be deputized as poll workers. When you see election problems, most of the time, it's because it's a volunteer staff of people who don't have the capability or the experience. We're in the customer service business. We know how to resolve issues. We're in the hospitality business. We're in the security business. So everybody felt highly comfortable quickly that we had the capability to do this. You need employee buy-in to make this work. And uh, the one thing that none of us want to acknowledge is the fear factor. You know, you commit your building and you become a worse polling location. You become a mess. You become a four hour wait and a disaster. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. That hurts your franchise. That hurts your business. That hurts your employee morale. But while the owners of the Hawks were busy creating a super polling location, another basketball owner in Atlanta was making their own headlines. In WNBA News, Atlanta Dream co-owner Kelly Loeffler is not in favor of the WNBA social justice plans. And Loeffler has sent a letter to Commissioner Kathy Engelbert objecting to the league's initiatives to honor the Black Lives Matter movement. And Kelly Loeffler, of course, wasn't just the co-owner of the Atlanta Dream. She was running to keep her seat as a U.S. Senator from Georgia. Leffler was objecting to a league decision to allow players to wear black warm-up jerseys with the words Black Lives Matter and say her name on them. In a letter to the league's commissioner, Leffler argued that instead, they should place an American flag on every jersey. And she stated that there needs to be less, not more, politics in sports. For the Atlanta dream, for myself, you know, we, we saw where we wanted to take a stand and just, and we did it. Last night, Elizabeth Williams, along with several teammates and players from other WNBA teams, wore a Vote Warnock shirt. It was a very carefully crafted message in support of U.S. Senate candidate Reverend Raphael Warnock. Players from every team in the WNBA would go on to wear shirts saying Vote Warnock. So here we've got a pause to marvel at a hard to make up element of this story the owner of a team named to evoke the work of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. effectively turned the team against herself to the point where that team endorsed her opponent, 
that opponent had the same job, pastor of the famed Ebenezer Baptist Church that the late Dr. King and his father once held. But the Reverend Raphael Warnock was part of what they call a nonpartisan blanket primary, part of a crowded field looking to challenge Leffler. And according to research by the Washington Post, the exposure helped boost Warnock's campaign at a critical time. 48 hours after the WNBA player started to wear his name, the campaign raised $183,000 and attracted 3,500 new grassroots donors. And by the time the election in November rolled around, Warnock was the only real challenger left for Leffler. We did our homework and we, we used our platforms. And those are the same platforms that a lot of people, you know, they, they tried to overlook, but we all band together and we used our platforms for something that we believed in. And it was only a few weeks after the WNBA players endorsed Warnock that NBA athletes would grab the sports world's attention. The Milwaukee Bucks have reportedly decided to boycott game five against the Orlando Magic in protest of the police shooting of Jacob Blake. The Bucks would boycott the game after police shot and paralyzed Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The other teams in the bubble in Orlando followed suit and NBA playoff games came to a halt, along with most of the rest of the sports world, from Major League Baseball to pro tennis. All eyes turned to the NBA for the next move. The Milwaukee Bucks were the team that decided they weren't gonna play, but it also took the rest of our leagues, the rest of our league and the rest of the teams that were playing that day to make that same decision. This is Lloyd Pierce. During the 2020 season, he was the head coach for the Atlanta Hawks. This was, in essence, the moment that we were preparing for. Uh, we had had our meetings as coaches and trying to strategize on what we could do uh, best to support our players when the time was right. Well, that was the time. That was the moment. The Hawks, of course, weren't in the NBA bubble at the time, having missed the playoffs for the third year in a row. Have I mentioned that it's a little tough to be an Atlanta sports fan? But the Hawks, from afar, ended up playing a critical role in the negotiations between the owners, the league, and the players. Two key agreements emerged. First, the league would set up a new committee on racial justice, and Coach Pierce would head it up. I think the direct um, measure of what we want to do is leverage what we can do as a league with all of our owners, all of our players, all of our coaches, so that we can take the action and the, the conversation from Orlando and amplify it into to real, tangible, direct action in our community and in our country. The second thing spoke directly to the voting issue, which had become the most tangible form of activism. Any NBA facility that could would become a voting center, and the Hawks had the blueprint. We had a lot of NBA teams, whether it was from the strike, there were a lot of teams that had been working on it prior to the strike. But it was really encouraging to see a lot of the organizations and the teams that represent this country stand up and provide that same opportunity across the country. There were several teams who had wanted to do something in their community and really hadn't decided what to do. And it was just great communication between team presidents that we sent out our schematic and our budget. And, you know, the biggest line item was security because you had to have a lot of security this year. I mean, that was the most, the highest expense. More than 40 sports arenas in the U.S. were ultimately converted to polling places during the 2020 elections. And some 300,000 people around the country were able to vote in the general election at NBA facilities alone. About 40,000 of those votes were all cast in State Farm Arena. Now keep in mind, the presidential election in the state of Georgia was decided by less than 15,000 votes. I think we really did create sort of the largest, safest, most efficient polling location this country had ever seen. I think the responsibility from my perspective is really to be a good community asset, to be a, a, hopefully a great business, a great franchise, win basketball games, and be a really positive member of the community. And when both U.S. Senate races would require a runoff, which would determine control of the U.S. Senate, this time the Hawks would be joined by the Falcons and their home, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. When I walked the, the stadium floor, and I've, I've walked our stadium thousands of times as part of my job description. This is Steve Cannon. He's the CEO of AMB Sports and Entertainment, the parent company of the Falcons and Atlanta United. He oversaw the election process at Mercedes-Benz 
which would split duty with State Farm Arena as a super polling location. But to come in on that early voting exercise, right, where our stadium was transformed for a special purpose in an important moment, and to see it, how beautifully it ran, it was laid out well, there was a buzz and, and conversations around, around our business, among our associates, hey, have you early voted yet? And how was your wait time? It was, it, it was amazing that we were buzzing about this election moment because I feel like we've all recognized the stakes of, of voting. And tell me a little bit about the, the fans in, in this regard who I, I dare say, you know, reflect the changing demographics of, of Atlanta. And I mean, there is an element I would imagine to this that is enlightened self-interest. You, you wanna keep your fan base. Uh, happy and, and reflect their values and, and their wants and needs. Tell me about that. Well, at the end, um, people do business with entities that they like, that they care about, and that they feel reflect and share their values. And businesses that do that will enjoy increasing success with the mindset of this younger consumer that frankly right now is coming of age and are the most powerful consuming cohort out there. The shift on the part of the owners to not just embracing but encouraging activism can't be overstated. It has spread to the college and even the high school level. It's also a reminder to those owners that this isn't just any old asset. So Tony, as an owner, it feels like you've witnessed a really important moment, a shift of sorts when it comes to player empowerment, in terms of activism, in terms of having a voice. It's not just tolerated anymore, it's really expected. Listen, people live in the community that they play in, that they work in, that they contribute to. 80% uh, of NBA players are African-American. Th these are our business partners. So to me, uh, we should uh, try to help support our business partners in any way possible and our communities. The idea of having a voice and the idea of being good business partners and the idea of standing up for what you think is right. I think that's all part of what the NBA is trying to achieve. In the runoff, Kelly Leffler, of course, lost that Senate seat. She ultimately decided as well to sell her stake in the Atlanta Dream. And Renee Montgomery would go from player to part owner. You know, it felt good to be, again, a part of the right side of history. We're black women. You know, there's a lot of black women in the WNBA. You know, majority of the league is minority. We understand the struggle. I think the days of kind of shut up and play, you're here for our entertainment. Those days, those days are over. And that, that genie's never going back in the bottle. And that's OK. And let's accept and celebrate it. The opportunity here and the exciting part is that black voters in Georgia got a taste of what that feels like when you are able to flex your muscle and decide who your leaders are going to be. 2020, as we like to say, more than a vote was just the tip off of our work. In fact, just a few months later, as LeBron and the rest of the NBA were headed to Atlanta for the All-Star Game, the GOP-controlled legislature in Georgia was aiming to roll back some of the efforts that made it easier to vote in the state. One of the key activists, former senator and former dream owner, Kelly Loeffler. We don't know what's gonna happen from here, but we understand things that need to be fixed. You know, we're part of a system that probably needs to be fixed, you know, so we get it. We get the idea of, you know, we, we have these platforms and we're gonna use them. Well, by now my bias toward Atlanta is clear, but there is a massive story here. It's undeniable that something new and important happened in the past year. The fact that it happened in Atlanta shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who knows its history, its economics, its demographics, and its politics. But few could have predicted that sports would play such a key role. Former Senator Leffler, remember, she said there should be less politics in sports. Having looked into this, I think it's fair to say there's gonna be more. And what happened in Atlanta says something bigger, something about sports and business and culture and how they're inextricably intertwined in a new and different way. It's a complicated world to be sure, but it sure is fascinating. Thanks so much for watching. Would love to hear what you think about this and other episodes about the business of sports. I'll be in the comments section. Can't wait to hear what you think.